From Harris Studios, this is Accounting for Tomorrow, an accounting and advisory services podcast for community leaders with a passion for change, who are ready to look past the numbers and ensure that today's planning efforts create success for tomorrow. So I'm really excited today for our listeners about our podcast. Just last week had our annual Harris CPA's economic update. I had a great showing. Over 100 people came to it. We had tons of people online. And I don't know how many years going, but we've had one of our great partners, Washington Trust Bank, a member of the FDIC, partner with us and provide their chief economist to come and give us an update and an outlook for 2024. And so today we have Conrad Ball, the Southern Idaho Regional President for Washington Trust Bank and a personal friend of mine, coming on here just to kind of give a recap over what we heard, what we saw, what we're looking to. So thank you, Conrad, for joining. Why don't you start by just giving us a little intro about yourself? Yeah, no, happy to. And I appreciate you having me. And we appreciate the partnership we have with Harris. And thank you for having Steve Scranton at your event for so many years. Steve is our chief investment officer and chief economist. And I think as Wayne Hammond said at your event is it's always tough following up the smartest guy in the room. And I think yeah. that's what I've been asked to do today, but we'll give it a shot. But a little bit about me, I've been in banking for about 20 years now. And I started with Washington Trust roughly 11 years ago. Really love being at the bank. Washington Trust is privately held and allows us to make long-term decisions on behalf of our clients, no matter what's going on with the economy. So it's nice to be able to always take that long-term view when, when working with our clients and our communities. And recently was promoted to the Southern Idaho Regional President. So I'm very, very excited to take on that role. And we've got a phenomenal team here in the Treasure Valley. Personally, married to my wife, Melissa, have two boys. Our boys are similar ages, Jameson and Cole at the same age, and then my nine-year-old, Gavin. And during my free time, they keep me busy, whether it's doing kids' activities or going up to Bogus and going skiing. It's just kind of dependent on, you know, basically their sports and their hobbies tend to drive my free time now. Awesome. So. Awesome. And congratulations on the promotion. I know Washington Trust has been a enormous partner with not only us, but then a lot of other companies and community organizations throughout not just Idaho, but Washington and some other surrounding states. So we appreciate you coming here. I think one of the interesting things that Steve does such a great job each year on is giving us the outlook in a very practical way, right? Not getting lost in the numbers and the extreme details, but being able to kind of outline it. And so maybe I kind of throw it over to you. What were your highlights that you took away about kind of what Steve was reporting? Yeah, I think Steve will always tell you that jobs create income and our job growth in Idaho and in the Treasure Valley exceeds that of the United States. Income fuels spending and spending is what drives growth. And I think one of the great things about the Treasure Valley is the velocity of money here. And it seems like those that are making a living in the Treasure Valley really have a tendency to use those dollars in the Treasure Valley. And so we continue to see the personal spending remain strong. I think from our perspective, the clients we talk with and many other businesses in the community, they will tell you that hiring is still very difficult. So I think there's a labor force issue as far as that goes. But I think if you want a job in the Treasure Valley, you are going to be able to find a job in the Treasure Valley and probably at a pretty good wage. The other thing that I always take from Steve is he will give you an idea of what's going on. And one of his big things is believe what you are seeing not what the media is saying. I think if we had gone off what the media was saying for the past 10, 15 years, as long as I've been in the industry, or at least as long as I've been listening to Steve, we probably would not have made many loans and we probably would have remained stagnant. So I think you have to look at what your core business is, those clients that you enjoy working with, those relationships that you have, take a look at your foundation and be adaptable to different economic environments. But I think if you look at what the media is saying, you're probably going to remain stagnant and not doing what's best. I, mean, I think so. Like, that's a great point. And I kind of come back to the jobs thing, too. If you saw the national media, right, jobs are growing a little bit, but not a ton, you know, 1% or so, whatever you're looking, but low. Whereas in Idaho, the data suggests that it's growing at a much faster rate, that the job growth is still there, which is why maybe our clients and our friends in the community are having a hard time finding people to continue to work, why we continue to hear that from 
people in this valley, but then also why we're still having steady growth in business. What are you hearing from some of your clients across the valley about jobs? Are they still hiring or how are they going into 2024 handling that? Yeah, that's a great question. Many of our clients are still looking looking to hire and it seems like skilled labor and those are, that are just very good at what they do, those skilled positions, they're still difficult to find. And I don't see that slowing down just, you know, with conversations around what Micron has going on with what St. Luke's has going on with Meta, some of these massive projects. And that doesn't even go into kind of what just your normal business dealings have in the Treasure Valley. So I think labor force will continue to be an issue moving forward. And the conversations we're having with our clients is making sure that you're taking care of your good people. And I'm sure you're seeing the same. Right, right. And so the other side of it, you got jobs and income. Mm Mm-hmm. So maybe explain a little bit about income and how jobs seem to be positive. But I know from the bank's perspective, income also needs to be kind of aligned. So maybe talk from an income side what you guys are seeing. Yeah, from an income standpoint, it seems like wages continue to go up. They are increasing. I think that's the force of the market. It's funny, during the the presentation, Steve mentioned, we talked about minimum wage for a little bit. And Steve mentioned, I don't even think you need to have a minimum wage because the market will drive what wages will be. In order to bring on those skilled people, you have to pay them a fair wage. You have to be able to give them an environment and a culture that they enjoy working in. So there's probably some give and take there. But we are seeing clients that are having to pay people more today than they maybe did a couple of years ago. And that's really just kind of a result of what's going on in the Treasure Valley. But at the same time, it seems like businesses are doing better than they were three, four years ago as well. So it seems like that should kind of go into that Reaganomics where, hey, if, you know, as businesses continue to flourish, it's going to help all those involved in the economy that those employees will start making more as well. Right. And you've seen that as you know, large projects like Amazon has moved into the Valley, or you start to talk about some of the future projects with Micron and some others, larger employees, St. Luke's, right? If they're dictating wages and even in the service industry, you have some national chains that are really raising their rate of pay, that's going to trickle through the entire economy. So... Yeah, and it, I think it's a good point, and it's something you know that Steve discussed in the meeting. I think everybody talks about inflation, too. Inflation is high. There, we do need to get it under control, and I think the Fed is working on that. At the same time as those wages have gone up, businesses do have to make a certain amount of profit margin, and so you're probably going to continue to see prices go up as well. So we see job growth, and we see income growth. The next thing he kind of discussed or we talked about was the spending by individuals in our valley. So maybe give us a little highlight on that. Yeah. So I think as as income growth continues to go up, we do see that personal consumption from the consumer continues to increase as well. And I think what you'll notice from Steve's presentation is that Idaho is typically stronger than what the U.S. as a whole is on the spending side. So kind of going back to that velocity of money, when you know, as a consumer here in the state of Idaho, people do spend the money that they tend to earn. And kind of what we've seen is that money is typically in the Treasure Valley. As we look at just overall economic growth in the U.S. since the, I don't know if it's a recession, because I'm not someone who predicts that, but the little dip that happened, you know, right at the beginning of the pandemic, really coming out of that, we've really seen a lot of growth going through, right? We're following the U.S., but we're also a little ahead of the U.S. here in Idaho. And that kind of makes sense if you look at jobs continue to grow, incomes continue to go up, and spending continue to go up. But there are some challenges that await us uh, as we go forward. You know, one of it is maybe just the labor force, Mm -hmm. right? We talked about that, and job growth is great. But what are some challenges as it relates to some of the labor force? Yeah, so the first thing I would say is on the recession side, and Steve mentioned this in the presentation, that recessions are a natural part of the business cycle. I mean, they typically happen every eight years or so. And it's not necessarily a bad thing for that to happen, especially if you're prepared for it. Those businesses that are prepared, it seems like some of their greatest opportunities come in those times of challenges. Mm -hmm. But I think that's where you kind of go back to your economic disaster plan. And are you prepared for when a recession does happen? Are you aware of the opportunities that could happen as well? So that's the first thing I'd say. But when it comes to challenges, one of the things that happens in the labor force is if, and I think this happened in Idaho to a certain extent with the immigration, is when your population growth is 
less than what your need for labor is, that's a real problem. 60% of the people that are hired right now that are part of that labor participation pool are female. So Steve brought it up that, hey, where are all the males at and why are they not participating in the labor force? The other thing that we're seeing, and I would imagine that businesses that are reliant on paying minimum wage will tell you as well, that younger generation, call it 15 to 22, 15 to 24, they're not participating in the labor force. And I can tell you, I started off my employment career as a bagger at Albertsons, and I think they probably paid me $4 an hour, and I don't even know if I was worth that. But now when you drive by a Hawkins Packout or you're looking at McDonald's, I mean, the minimum wage there is 15 to $18 an hour. And if I were a young kid, I'd love to be making 15 to $18 an hour, but I don't know if I'd be hired at that or I'd have the skill set. And so I think that's been a challenge for businesses. There's just not that participation from some of the younger folks either. Right. I think it's an interesting challenge that I don't think people know the answer to yet because it was a lot of people just use the excuse, well, the baby boomer population is retiring and that's why the labor force is decreasing. But when you actually look at it, that's not necessarily true. A lot of them early retired and now they're coming back because their stock portfolio didn't quite perform like they thought. And so they're actually coming back into the labor pool Whereas it's really some of the younger generations that are just slower at getting into that pool. So how we adapt to that, I don't think there's an actual answer, but it's going to be an interesting challenge for everyone to kind of work through. Yeah, no, you're 100% correct. If we look at the 55 to 64-year-olds, that labor force is still extremely strong. And a lot of it is high skill jobs, higher paying jobs. And you're right, some of those folks are coming back into the workforce as a result of you kind of hit that bare minimum of your retirement based on your anticipated returns. You had a dip in the stock market and or you weren't getting the returns as anticipated and said, well, I better get back to work. But like you said, that labor participation rate in the 55 to 64 year olds is still extremely strong. Right. And we also kind of highlighted some of the issues related to the costs going up and some inflation and that impact it has on the labor pool. You had dual earners in a household in the past, well, now when you're staring at childcare that's you know exceeding four thousand dollars a month in some places in the country and and even higher, that's hard for people to justify continuing to have both people work in their household and one stays home just because of the cost of childcare. And I know there's large businesses that can build their own childcare, but small businesses, you know, that's going to be a struggle for them as they try and balance that because they won't necessarily have the ability to build a daycare. <laughs> yeah, no, I 100% agree. And, and it is a significant expense. And I'm not sure you know what needs to be done about it. But I can tell you there's been experiences where some families are just breaking even. And even with good wages, you're breaking even just to pay your childcare costs. And then it really becomes a personal decision of does it make sense for one of the family members to quit and stay home? Or do you both work the job because you love the job and you're breaking even from a childcare cost standpoint? Right. So... So a lot of positives on job growth and income, a little bit of inflation and some cost side as well, and just challenges as we're going to continue to work through those in 2024. But I've got a banker here, so (laughs) I've got to ask Conrad, when we kind of switch over here to borrowing, I'm sure you get this a dozen times a day, and I'm not asking you to predict where interest rates are going, but just how (laughs) how do people work through interest rates, what's going on in the Fed? How do you tell clients to deal with that without giving us your 2024 prediction? (laughs) No, that's a great (laughs) way to set it up. With predictions, I actually like where Steve was predicting things because he gave a pretty good range. And so maybe I'll do that one and just go off of Steve's numbers because he's way smarter than I am, especially in this area. But I think, Josh, there's a lot of people that have a mortgage under 3% and certainly a lot under 4%. And I think you get used to those low interest rates very, very quickly. And I will tell you from a banker perspective, it's much easier to have a conversation with a client to discuss loan terms when the rates are going to be below 4% or 5% or whatever Mm -hmm. it is. When you start talking, you know, loan terms in the mid sevens, eights, nines on a floating rate standpoint, that becomes a much different conversation and it adds a significant expense. And so as we're helping clients navigate, I think the big thing is kind of going back to our early conversation is taking a long-term perspective. If you take a look at where rates are today, they're probably right in line with what they were historically. And so then it goes back to, okay, are we doing the right thing for our business? 
Are we getting a long-term appreciation of this asset? So kind of back to Steve's point, you know, don't make a bad long-term decision based on short-term conditions. Take a look. Is this a good asset? Does it make sense for us to move forward with? And that's really the advice that we're giving clients as well. The floating rates, that certainly had an impact with Fed funds going to eight and a half, you know, prime borrowers borrowing at eight, eight and a half when they were at three and a quarter or three and seven five earlier, kind of depending on where the Fed funds was. But that's going to add a significant cost when your cost of borrowing more than doubles. So it has come as quite a shock to some of our clients. And I think that they're reacting appropriately. You get more efficient, you get more effective. But I think the big thing is, is just always taking that long-term standpoint with your capital purchases. Yeah, I know for us, the IRS adjusts their rate as the Fed does and charges interest for clients. And I know several who, when the interest rate was at two or 3%, right, they would just pay their tax at the end of the year. But now <laughs> they tell them like, oh, it's 8%. They're like, oh, let's start paying estimates. Yeah, it becomes a little yeah, different conversation, a little different right? Conversation. So Definitely, it just creates a bigger expense, you know, that people just have to evaluate. Um, yeah. And I think on the borrowing side, you know, Steve talked about this a little bit. You know, the vehicle that you're borrowing on, you really want to take a look at that because Steve mentioned that credit card debt is now above $1 trillion. And so you talk about it's one thing to borrow at maybe eight and a half, nine, nine and a half percent, depending on where you're borrowing based on prime, but you start borrowing between 18 and 30 percent. Well, that's going to have a significant impact on your life. Yeah, and I think a lot of people sign up for credit cards and don't realize that their rate's floating. Yeah, right? exactly. Being it's based adjusted. on prime. Yep. And so they thought when they originally signed up, they had the 12% rate two years ago. Well, most of those cards are probably somewhere between 20 and 30%. Right and now. as far as I know, there's no ceiling on what can be charged on credit cards. So right. something so. to keep in mind. Right. Those points might not be quite as worth it. <laughs> exactly. you know? I mean, if you're paying off your credit card every month yeah. and have that ability... You know, that's great. It's not costing you anything. But if you're using it to finance things for multiple months, you got to be aware of what that impact is currently, not what it was when you signed up for the credit card three or four years ago. Yeah, completely agree. But, you know, I'll tell you from a, a loan standpoint, I guess blessings of being in the Treasure Valley is we still have a lot of deal flow. We still have a lot of loan requests going. I just think that's as a result of the opportunity and clients are taking a look at the return that they would be able to get on the asset that they're financing or kind of on what that cost of capital is, and still moving forward with investing in that, those capital purchases. But the other thing is, and I'm sure others can speak to this as well, but depositors or those that were liquid, they're also starting to have options with their money, which is impacting decisions as well. At one point, if you were earning 0% on your ex excess liquidity, or maybe 20 basis points on your excess liquidity, you may have been in a hurry to start getting some return on that. But with treasuries above five, kind of depending on how your account's structured, what your deposit rate is, you might be a little bit more patient with uh, deploying that capital and not be in as big a hurry. So Interesting. Interesting. I always think two things that people try and pin you on, Conrad. One's the interest rate, yeah. and you worked around that. <laughs> awesome right there. I wish I had a crystal ball. It would be, <laughs> was, yeah. Well, we wouldn't have to work if we all. But one is interest rate. The other one's got to be inflation. Mm -hmm. Right. You probably get both those hand in hand yep. on a daily basis. So maybe switch over to inflation. What do you guys see or what are you telling businesses and people how to plan for what you guys are seen or when it comes to inflation? Yeah, infl inflation is definitely a challenge. And if you take a look at inflation, I think the one thing that gets lost on people is if you have six or seven percent inflation, whatever it is, if something costs a dollar, you have seven percent inflation. So now it's a dollar and seven cents. Just because you have one or two percent inflation the next year, your baseline is now that seven percent inflation mark. So it's gone from a dollar seven plus another two percent. Right. And that, that has a significant impact on our clients. And the other thing is the way that you know inflation is measured, it depends on what you buy. I can tell you if you have gone on a vacation recently your cost of a hotel is probably double or more what it was two years ago. If you go to the grocery store, depending on what you're consuming, it is going to be much more expensive. If you go out to eat, it's going to be much more expensive. I think energy costs have stayed reasonable, but for the most part, everything that we're buying today is much more expensive than it was two years ago. And I think if you look at that personal consumption standpoint, that's the other piece that I would say is just because wages are going up, you're probably hearing people saying, well, it doesn't really feel like I'm making 
that much more, and that's because it is going to purchase those goods and services that have increased in price. Right. And that kind of trickles through the whole economy, right? Everyone's dealing with this. Everyone's raising prices. It's kind of a domino effect that happens. And I think the highlight here, energy prices and stuff have stayed fairly stable, which has a huge impact on the national inflation metrics and numbers that get put out there. But then you have the actual inflation that people see on a day-to-day basis, which is what you're talking about. Yeah, it, that's a little bit different than what you read in the media. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. So if you take a look at it and you say inflation's come down, if you're talking to your neighbor, they might say, I don't feel like inflation's gone right. down at all. It seems like things are still way more expensive. Or if you're looking to purchase a, a new vehicle, or inflation will impact people differently depending on what you're considering. Right, especially in homes and especially in this valley. The inflation of and the price of housing here has dramatically been higher than what the national inflation is. And so we've seen that. And we talked a lot about that at the economic, just kind of the impact of now kind of based on just average and median home sales prices and medium income, one earner 65 or 70% of their income has to go to it. So it's almost requiring a dual income household to be able to purchase homes now. And how is that going to impact? And we've seen a little bit of a pullback in the last year, but it's still pretty high, which just puts more pressure on people. Yeah, I think, you know, home prices from Steve's chart were down, what, two, two and a half percent or so year over year, but it kind of goes back to that inflation conversation we were having earlier, just because something's gone down 2% over the past 12 months, you know, you got to look at, well, what happened the prior 24, 36 months before that? And we saw uh, a major increase in the median home price here in the Treasure Valley. And I believe looking at Steve's numbers, that's 65%. That's 65% of your gross income. So at this point, it really does take dual income to be able to afford a home in the Treasure Valley. And that's a, a result of home builders will tell you the cost of materials have gone up significantly. The cost of labor has gone up significantly. The cost of land has gone up significantly. Steve mentions kind of the not in my backyard. I think we're all in agreement that, hey, we need more housing. We need more affordable housing. I've got a great spot that I think that you should build those homes in, but it's not really around the area that I live in. And so I think it's how do we work together as a community to solve some of those to issues. solve, the, solve yeah. some of these issues. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm not going to ask you to predict or not predict a recession. <laughs> okay. We saw Steve do that. He gave us tons and tons of stats on it. And usually no one can agree. So we'll just have to <laughs> agree to disagree and agree to agree on a bunch of different topics. You know, we don't really know where that's going or what's that, but he always gives us a couple takeaways at the end. One you know, that recessions are kind of a natural process that is good for the economy. You don't want to have drastic or dramatic recessions like maybe we had, you know, back in the housing crisis, but a normal recession is actually healthy for our economy. And so when you think about it in that way, if ones are coming, he talks about creating opportunities. So what can businesses do to prepare for those normal recessions or for normal growth times, what are things that you tell them to help create opportunities, regardless of where kind of the economy goes? I think one of the main things is there's always going to be a one-time event. Every single year, it seems like we experience this one-time event. We just don't know what that event is going to be. And with recession, we can't predict when it's going to be, but we know that it's likely going to happen. We don't know what the impact is, but I think we need to take a look at our at our businesses and say, how can we be best prepared for a recession when it does happen? And what opportunities can we expect? And to me, it seems like those that are kind of focused on their core operation, that have that strong foundation, they're able to be adaptable in different economic environments. The other item is making sure that you have a strong liquid balance sheet. And that's going to allow you to have opportunities as well. Having conversations with your clients, with your vendors, find out, hey, what is your plan if a recession does happen? Because what you don't want to happen is if you're working with a particular vendor or a particular client and they experience a recession and they're not ready. One of the conversations we have with clients is, that's great that you're generating receivables. Make sure you're keeping an eye on them. Make sure that money's coming home. 
when it's supposed to come home because you've done the work, you've earned that money, but until it hits the bank account, if something happens, it may not come in. So just make sure you're working closely with your clients. And then I think it's, you know, how are you going to view this? Because if and when a recession does happen, it will create opportunity for you. And so it's being able to look out and say, what are those opportunities that could happen? And if they are there, do I take advantage of them? Because if you're just stagnant, you're not willing to do anything, you're going away from kind of your core foundation, it's probably going to be incredibly difficult because recessions are difficult as it is. But some of the clients that I've worked in in the past, some of their greatest opportunities are a result of going through that recession. Right. I mean, you got to have a plan, right, of how you're going to capitalize on those plans. At the same time, people who are pessimists and are always thinking there's a recession, you know, down the road and it just keeps on getting extended out are also missing on some of the growth opportunities that they have now. Yeah. So, you know, to be optimistic, but also to be prepared yeah. is what I always try and talk to clients about and make sure we're ready. Like you said, your vendors, your customers, making sure they're strong because they could impact you. You could have the best laid plan for your own company, but if your customers and your vendors aren't also ready to adapt with the economy, right, that will impact you. So make sure you're prepared, but also, you know, stay optimistic. Yeah, like, exactly. Look, and I would say, yes, be prepared, have your plan, but also be adaptable to what opportunities right. are coming your way. Right. Thank you, Conrad, for coming in today. We really appreciate the help. We had a phenomenal event and tons of information. And, and anyone who's seen Steve speak on the economy and where it's going knows how much of a wealth of information he is. But And we really appreciate Washington Trust partnering with us and providing that. We have it every year. So we hope to continue to see people come out and get that. But we really appreciate you coming on here and giving us a little recap. So those of our clients and listeners who couldn't attend the event could get a lot of the information. So thank you again for coming on. Nope. Nope. Appreciate it, Josh. We always enjoy working with you and the folks at Harris and definitely appreciate you guys having Steve every year. And I know it's one of his favorite events to go to and looking forward to continuing to work with you in the future here. So thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Harris CPA's Accounting for Tomorrow. Stay tuned for new episodes each month. Podcasts are also available on our website at harriscpas.com slash podcasts. Any accounting business or tax advice contained in this podcast is not intended as a thorough in-depth analysis of specific issues, nor a substitute for a formal opinion, nor is it sufficient to avoid tax-related penalties. If you'd like, Harris CPAs would be pleased to perform the research and provide you with a detailed analysis of your specific situation.